Thank you, sirs. So on behalf of uh, Pune International Center and myself, I would like to invite and welcome all of you to this wonderful gathering of uh, arranged by Pune International Center. This is the uh, second lecture in the series of uh, Crazy About Science and Technology. The first lecture we had here itself in ICER and it was given by Dr. Pramod Kale. This is the second in this particular series and we have an exciting topic today and we have an extremely good speaker with us. So the topic uh, is a Nobel Prize in Physics of 2017, the discovery of gravitational waves. Uh, friends, you all know gravitational waves have literally taken waves or they have made waves in the recent uh, few years. Since 2017, and as we all know, this happened because three American scientists got a Nobel Prize in 2017 for their invention or for, for, their, for the discovery. The scientists were Weiss, Thorne, and Barry Barish. They won Nobel Prize for their first observations on gravitational waves ripples in space-time fabric. This was anticipated, as we all know, one century ago by Albert Einstein, and he had predicted uh, this, that it would, it would happen and it was actually proved in recent times. All these three scientists, they played leading roles in the laser interferometric gravitational wave observatory, which is called as LIGO, and they did experiments there, which in 2015, uh, they made observations on gravitational waves triggered by a violent merger of two black holes and uh, a billion of light years away. One of the Nobel committee member has described this particular contribution as a discovery that shook the world. LIGO detections finally confirmed Einstein's prediction of events that can stretch and squeeze the space fabric or space-time fabric generating ripples. This is something which is very, very interesting, and we are, we are really lucky to have an eminent speaker with us today, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Sanjeev Durandar. He's a professor emeritus from Inter-University uh, Inter Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, that is IUCA in Pune. We have the chairperson uh, of this particular program, uh, Professor Amitav Malik. Those who are from PIC already know Professor Malik, and many of us in Pune do know him very well. However, in short, I'll just introduce him. Professor Amitav Malik is a renowned laser scientist of India, uh, of India, responsible for indigenous laser power uh, R&D that led to the establishment of directed energy weapon technology in the country. He is a founder director of LASTEC, which is Laser Science and Technology Center in Delhi, which is a DRDO's organization, and he was awarded Padma Shri in 2002 for his outstanding contributions to India's defense capability. Earlier, Professor Malik served as a professor of electronics at DIIT, the place where even I work now as a professor in physics. He was there in uh, DIIT and he worked there for 10 years and has continued to mentor and guide young scientists and engineers for their ME and PhD programs in lasers and electronics. Professor Malik also served as an advisor uh, defense technology at Embassy of India in Washington, D.C. for six years from 1988 to 1994, where his pioneering diplomatic effort was instrumental in reversing major U.S. technologies uh, which, embargo political, uh, which embargo policies against India. After retirement, Professor Malik was invited to serve as a member of National Security Advisory Board for three successive years from 2003 to 2006, where he brought special focus on space security as well as on energy and environment security. Professor Malik has authored uh, seven books on technology and security issues and has contributed to over 50 technical and strategic analysis, analysis papers. At Pune, since 2006, Professor Malik is a founding member and honorable trustee, honorary trustee of newly created Pune International Center, which is a think tank for public policy research established, established in 2011. He leads many activities out of which environment and climate change uh, for making Pune carbon neutral by 2030 is one of his uh, major activities under the umbrella of PIC. Now, friends, I'll just introduce you to the speaker of today, Professor uh, Durandar. 
Professor Sanjeev Durandar, he has, is, an, is, a, is a person of international repute and has many, many distinctions to his credit. I'll try to cover them up in a, in a, in a, in a, short, in a small time span. Uh, the direct detection of gravitational waves is a major discovery of the century in physics. The discovery received Nobel Prize in 2017, as I just mentioned. And we are all happy to note this, that Professor Sanjeev Durandar and his group at Ayuka made significant contributions to this particular discovery. Professor Sanjeev Durandar and his team trust uh, shared in two major international awards given to the collaboration apart from their other individual ones. They are mentioned as he has got Vigyan Bhushan Firodia Award uh, on, in, in 2016, Milner's Special Breakthrough Prize for Fundamental Science, then he has got Gruber Prize for Cosmology, ABP Maza Award in 2017 for Top Achievers in Maharashtra, the TMC Pune Gaurav Award for, to, uh, for 2017 in, uh, as Top Achievers in Pune. He is a member of Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, and Maharashtra Academy of Sciences. His uh, achievement and initiatives uh, are listed as Sanjeev Durandar is a pioneer in India in his field and started the field in India in 1989 when he joined Ayuka. Professor Durandar's former PhD students and postdoctoral fellows are now occupying high positions in Indian institutes and also abroad. He's responsible for substantially contributing, uh, uh, contributing to create extremely good manpower uh, which will develop, which will be used by our country and also abroad. Um, abroad, Professor Durandar had a vision of promising a gravitational wave detector on Indian soil in 1989. Unfortunately, this project was not funded. He is one of the proposers of LIGO India project uh, uh, of constructing a detector on Indian soil. This project has been recently approved in principle by Honorable Prime Minister of India. His professional, high, professional career highlights are, he he's awarded his PhD in 1981 in astrophysics at TIFR Mumbai under the guidance of Professor Jayan Naralikar. He had several international collaborations with uh, directors group in US, in Germany, in Japan, and in France. He's the only, he has, he was the only Indian group at Ayuka which was a part of LIGO collaboration since year 2000. He has more than 100 research publications in international journal to his credit. Since 1989, Professor Durandar's group at Ayuka was involved in data analysis, as, data analysis aspect of this particular experiment, and uh, he has optimally he was able to extract the gravitational wave signals from the noise. In early 1990s, Professor Durandar's group was one of the two groups in the world working in this particular field, the other one being at Caltech, US, uh, for which the Nobel Prize was awarded. We are extremely happy, sir, to have you with us. And uh, I would now request uh, the chairperson of this particular program, Professor Amitav Malik, to uh, say a few words. Thank you. Namaskar. Let me add my own welcome to you all, and of course, special welcome to our esteemed speaker today, Professor Durandar. Um, most of you know what PIC is, and I must also add that uh, Dr. Sangeeta Kale, who introduced us, herself is a senior professor in physics with a lot of research work in, and particularly in nanotechnology. So one day he will, we will set, set and listen to her also. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Dhananda on the topic of discovery of gravitational wave for the simple reason that I'm basically a laser technologist. And the LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Observatory, the heart of it is the laser interferometer. So it gives me great pleasure and pride that uh, laser invented in 1960 was very correctly described as a discovery in search of applications. And here we are, a path-breaking research work in gravitational wave has been possible thanks to laser interferometry. My field, of course, has been different. I'm, I have worked in the high power laser for directed energy applications, in particular application for 
defending our satellites thousands of kilometers away, where a ground-based laser can be directed to a satellite to nullify. It has specific implications not only for defense, but even for space technology because any activity in space that can create debris is very detrimental and that cannot be used. So direct energy weapon is one that can be used in the, in the space arena without creating debris and that's why it becomes a very viable um, technology to be used. That is why today in the world there are only five or six countries that have this capability and we in India achieved that in 2001. I think an exciting topic today, so I'll not drag you back to what was what. But I must say that my generation has seen phenomenal changes in just one 50 or 60 years. And out of that, the last 25 years have been absolutely amazing. Uh, today we already have artificial intelligence which is almost vying to compete with the human capability. And the next 25 years will be even more exciting. So in this backdrop, to realize that Einstein's postulation of general theory, general relativity theory, took 100 years to actually get validated through this experiment, and that has created completely new horizon for our understanding for our cosmos and our world. So it, it's a very exciting future for the scientists and technologists of today, and it is, it is with that view that PIC has started this series on science and technology, and we have dared to call it crazy about science and technology, just to make it more exciting. The idea came from one of our trustees, Mr. Um, Ravi Pandit, who is the chairman of the KPIT. So you see, uh, PIC is full of uh, people that have ideas, and we try to bring in as much as possible to the people as, as possible. And this is one exercise where today we will have the opportunity to understand how Professor Durandar and his team contributed so hugely to something path-breaking, something almost game-changing. Let me welcome Professor Durandar, please. So first of all, I would like to thank the Pune International Center for inviting me to give this talk uh, over here. And uh, so, <coughs> I mean, I'm very grateful and happy to be here. Uh, Professor Malik, Dr. Sangeeta Kare. Uh, Sangeeta Kare has uh, already, uh, I mean, said a lot about the thing. I thought they were going to give my talk. So, uh, <laughs> almost the thing. So, but anyway, <laughs> I'm saved and still, uh, I think I can still contribute more to the thing. <coughs> And also, I am also, uh, uh, I mean, thankful to uh, Dr. Mashelkar, who actually, uh, uh, I mean, who actually uh, told me that about the PIC, the Pune International Center, and so on, and to, I mean, encourage me to do this thing. So I am basically happy to be here, and uh, I would like to say something about this Nobel Prize which was given in physics in 2017 on, uh, and it went to gravitational waves. Right, okay. So this was a discovery of gravitational waves and uh, actually the first event was observed on 14th September 2015. That was when we saw the, the signal was seen. I was ex exactly at that time in US, okay, at that time. And I got this mail within three minutes or something that uh, they had already detected and said that there is a, some kind of signal. But you cannot say that there is a signal there immediately because you don't know. It may be noise, it could be anything. And sometimes also there are people who are very close in the group of LIGO who purposely put a signal. <laughs> so to test the data analysts that they are alert or the thing. So we didn't know exactly at that time whether it was a noise, whether it was actually a signal or whether it was put by somebody in the, in the detector, you know, in the thing. But then as time went on, so it took few months to really know, realize that it is not 
anyway, uh, it is not noise. So at least it was that was clear. But it was not so sure. People are not so sure that whether it is actually a signal put by somebody or whether it is actually a signal from the thing. But I was more or less sure because I knew the psychology of those people who put the signals. They would never put a signal at such high signal to noise ratio. The signal to noise ratio was enormous out of the, I mean, we never imagined such a high signal to noise ratio. And it corresponded to black holes of 30 solar masses. And our general models of astrophysics did not predict such high masses for black holes. So that is why I thought that this cannot be anybody, I mean, they would put something of maybe at the most usually 10 or 12, that would be the signal to noise or maybe maximum 15. But when something comes at 25, I said, this is, uh, it can't be anybody except somebody out of their minds. Only they can put such uh, high thing. And so I, there were all sorts of bets going on and so on. So I betted on the signal and then I won my bet. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, that's the, <laughs> one of the things which is there. <coughs> Okay, so let me start with the story basically of the, this Nobel Prize. So the Nobel Prize went to three of these people. Is it how visible? Okay. Kip Thorne, okay, who was there, who I was mostly, I mean, very closely associated with also, quite closely. And uh, so Kip Thorne, Rainer Weiss, okay, he was in Caltech, MIT, and Barry Barish, and who was the LIGO, he was more administrator of the whole LIGO science collaboration. And this Nobel Prize was given for the decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. Uh, this was a Nobel committee. And, but one should not forget that this was a whole team effort. It was a big team effort, LIGO science collaboration. So there were so many people who contributed to this whole uh, discovery. Uh, that, I mean, that one should in fact recognize that this was the case and so did we. I mean, we, we also contributed in certain aspects of this experiment. I mean, this experiment is actually very multidisciplinary as uh, Professor Amitabha <coughs> Malik pointed out <laughs> that it is also, it is lasers is one of the heart of the thing which lies there. There is laser technology, there is vacuum technology, control systems, everything comes there, high power, high performance computing. Also mathematics, statistics, relativity, the last three are my specializations basically. And uh, so it, it is a whole mix of things and that is what in fact attracted me towards this field in 30 years ago when I started in this. And one should not forget this person actually, Drever, Ron Drever, okay, who expired on uh, seven, just before the thing, few, six months before the Nobel Prize was given or six, seven months. I, he was, I think he deserved the Nobel Prize the most, absolutely. I mean, he was, uh, he was an amazing man. I mean, I many times had discussions with him and uh, every day he came up with a new idea. Many of the ideas which are there in this interferometer are due to him, you know, this, uh, Ron Drever. And I had discussed with him the Indian detector, actually, I had at length, how to build a detector in India with him about 30 years ago, in 1988, actually, with him. And uh, at that time, we had thought of doing some things and all that. And uh, anyway, that's a different, long, different story. <laughs> so no, this Ron Drever, I mean, unfortunately expired before the Nobel Prize. Otherwise, he would have surely been there. Okay, so let me uh, start with the story, which is the, the century-long wait. So Einstein actually gave his theory of gravitation, Einstein's gravitation in 1915, okay, so he presented his theory to the Prussian Academy of Sciences at Berlin, okay, in 1915 and where he gave his famous equations, Einstein's equations in uh, November 25, 1915 in Berlin. <coughs> and so, and this was in 1915, this is after the special theory of relativity which was given in 1905, so after 10 years. Then I will come to that, why did he give that? And after one year, basically predicted, the so this theory predicts the existence of gravitational waves. So they were predicted in 1916 and while the direct detection of gravitational waves was 100 years later, exactly 100 years later, 2016. So I will tell you why it took 100 years actually to detect these waves, okay. And this confirmed, I mean when we saw these waves and so on, 
the waves in fact confirmed the predictions of general relativity. So, general relativity exactly predicts that waveform. Okay. The exact waveform which comes out is predicted by that general theory of relativity 100 years ago which was given by uh, Einstein. Okay. And this was the first test what we call in the strong field regime. Okay. So, this was the first time that two black holes collided they produced gravitational waves and black holes are strong field gravity. Black holes are the strongest gravity that you can ever get. And so, they collided, they were moving at the speed of more than half the speed of light. So, it is really uh, uh, general relativity has been tested to its I mean its ultimate level. I mean there were other tests of gravity long time back I mean there by Eddington and so on. As soon as the theory was given in 1919, um, Eddington, who was also a Nobel laureate that time in astronomy, he led an expedition for the solar eclipse. Okay. So, there was an eclipse and during that eclipse, uh, what, was, uh, what was expected is there were stars behind the sun and because of general theory of relativity, they, one of the predictions was that the light would bend around the sun. The light is affected by the gravitational field. So, if it bends around the sun, you see the star. Okay. So, the gravitational, uh, gravitational, the general relativity prediction was that one should see stars behind the sun, which should be normally be black, blocked actually. And that was, the, that was observed actually. And the amount the light bent and all that exactly came out to be 1.75 arc seconds and so on. Okay. So, that everything came out like that. So, that was the first of the tests. Okay. Then there are many other tests were given. So, one was other test was uh, the perihelion shift of mercury which was already known even before general theory of relativity that the planets which are there mercury in particular because it's the closest to the sun that the orbit precesses it's not a perfect ellipse so what happens is that uh, if there's a chalk i can draw this thing no chalk ah there's a chalk here yeah so so generally the newton's theory predicts the ellipse a perfect ellipse okay so for a for a planetary orbit but general relativity does not do this. It predicts a precessing ellipse. So, your orbit is something like this. That is the orbit. Okay. Of course, I have exaggerated this uh, quite a lot. The precision is extremely small. It is something like 43 seconds of arc per century. Okay. It is extremely small uh, precision and that precision was observed for mercury. Okay. And Einstein's theory predicts that. Newton's theory does not. So, these were some of the tests of general relativity, but these are all what are called weak field tests. And the weak field means because the field in certain sense, I mean it is hard for me to go into exactly the details of general theory of relativity. The space time is almost flat. Okay. I mean in general relativity, what you have is the gravitation is described through the curvature of space time. Okay. And if your space is flat, that means there is no curvature, there is no gravity. So, slight if there is a very weak gravity then the curvature will be very little. Okay. So, that is what happens here in the cases of the sun or the mercury or this thing. There is also a redshift uh, experiment where the photon is uh, you know is fired in the direction up, up I mean direction away from the earth. The cell phone is testing your general theory of relativity and special theory of relativity every minute okay, in the GPS system. When you I think somebody came to pick me up he was using the GPS. I do not know whether he knew that he was actually up applying general relativity and special relativity okay, each time. So, why is that done? Because of the fact that there are satellites going around the earth and so on and you have to synchronize the clocks in the satellites and the one in the cell phone. And every and because the satellites are moving, uh, because of the special theory of relativity as given by Einstein, the clocks, the time moves at a different rate in the, in the satellites and as it moves here. Okay. So, the, so there is a difference. So, even if you synchronize say now in 10 minutes the clocks get out of synchrony. Okay. So, you need to synchronize the clocks very soon, very quite often if you want to, if you want your GPS to work. If you do not synchronize the clocks for something like a day, then you will be off by something like 10 kilometers. So, the person who had come to get me would have gone to Puna station or something like that, but <laughs> and I would not be here giving this talk. So, that is the kind of thing. So, that is how important relativity and all these things. So, both special relativity as well as general relativity are tested every 10 minutes 
do with your GPS. Okay? But these are all again weak field tests of gravity. This is a strong field test for the first time that gravity has been tested in the strong field regime. And the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2017. So what happened? I mean, so this was the sort of a computer simulation which tells you. The discoveries are binary black holes. So there are several after the, so there was one discovery in uh, November, I mean September 14th, 2015, but several have happened since then. So they are basically binary black holes and neutron stars. So they are binary black holes which go around each other. As they go around each other, they emit waves. They emit waves, as they emit waves, they lose energy. As they lose energy, they fall towards each other, okay? And then they coalesce. So that's the, that's the whole thing, that's the event which we observed. And so here is one of the things that Thorn, okay, in 1986, in fact, he had predicted the, that these will be the best objects that will be visible to the detectors we build, that laser interferometry detectors. So, this, so and that's what has been observed. So I think he certainly deserves the Nobel Prize. That <laughs> all the ob objects that have been observed so far are binary, compact binary coalescences, either black holes or what are called neutron stars. So neutron stars are also very, uh, very compact objects. The objects are have say the mass of the sun, but the size of the star is only 10 kilometers in size. The radius is something like 10 kilometers. So they are extremely dense stars and they have extremely strong gravitational fields and therefore they are good objects for producing gravitational waves. And that's what we saw over here. And this was predicted, uh, I mean Thorn had predicted this in 1986, that was the thing. So what have we seen? So we have seen something like 6.9 one can say events okay, in this thing. 5.9 black hole coil is 9.9 is because one of them is, one is not sure, one of them is whether it is a really a gravitation wave event or whether it is noise. So 90 percent it is a event, 10 percent it is noise. And others have been confirmed to the level of 1 in 100 million or 1 in 10 million or something like that. So any detection in fact is a statistical statement. In way. When you say that something is detected, it is always a probability. The probability may be very close to 1 maybe 0 0.9999, so many things, but uh, it is never one. So when I say that somebody is sitting there, okay, I do not know exactly. I mean, I can see something, maybe there is somebody there, maybe it is a hologram, how do I know? But the almost probability is one part in 100 million that somebody is sitting there, it is like that. <laughs> so this black hole we have seen, one part in 100 million, okay, well, the probability was the probability that it is noise is one part in 100 million or something. Okay. So this, what did they show? They showed the detection of gravitational waves. So first thing was that one we saw the detection of gravitational waves because, of, because the arms vibrated and so on and we could detect the gravitational waves. But this was also a direct detection of black holes. First time we detected black holes directly. Okay. This was not earlier the case. I mean we said there were black holes and so on. But they were all what you call indirect detections. Like we say there is a black hole sitting at the center of our galaxy. How do you know there is a, there is a big black hole, supermassive black hole of some 4 million solar masses. 4 million times the mass of the sun is a black hole sitting at the center of our galaxy. How do you know that? We know that because we look at the orbits of the stars at the center of the galaxy and then apply Kepler's law. Okay? Kepler's law uh, immediately gives you the mass. The Kepler's law is... Uh, simply this, A cubed omega square is gm, okay, so that is the Kepler's law. A is the distance between the stars, omega is the angular frequency at which they are rotating, m is the total mass. Okay. So if you measure A, if you measure omega, you know what is m, g is the Newton's constant. And from this you can make out it is something like 4 meters, you see the orbits of the stars. You can calculate all those things and you know what size it is, what, what is the size of the object also by looking at the, by telescopes and things like that. And it is, it is 4 million solar masses in a very small region. So what else can it be but a black hole? So that is how you infer there is a black hole. We do not directly see a black hole, we can never see a black hole directly. 
But gravitational waves, we can directly see a black hole. That's one of the things. So direct detection of black holes. And first time we saw also a, a binary black hole. So there are many binaries seen, the two stars going around each other. So there are radio stars, there are main sequence stars as they are called and so on. So X-ray binaries are there. So stars which emit in X-rays and so on. But the first time we saw was the binary black holes. And the masses ranged from, for all these events, the masses ranged from something like 7 to 36 solar mass. And the distances were, oh, I've written in megaparsec. Parsec is a unit used by uh, astronomers. One parsec is 3 light years, about 3.25. So this is like 410, it's like 1.3 billion light years. And this is like 3 billion light years. So 3 billion light years away. One light year is the distance. Uh, light travels in one year, okay, one light year. And it's about 10 to the 13 uh, kilometers. So you multiply the number of seconds by the speed of light, you get 10 to the 13 km. So this is about one light year. So that's the thing, okay. So that far away they are. <laughs> and so what was there? Another thing which I want to say is that this uh, the one black hole, black hole and one neutron. The last two events, the Virgo detector also observed. So one thing huh, which I forgot to mention was that all these things were observed by the LIGO detectors. There are two LIGO detectors in the US. They saw these events. So five of them, you can say, were seen by just the LIGO detectors. But the last two events in August were seen also by the Virgo detector is another detector which is in Europe, okay, in Italy actually, where Pisa, actually in the tower of Pisa is, it's in fact quite close there. It's a French-Italian collaboration. So let me go back into the, this thing that just to tell something about, uh, this is mainly for students or people who have forgotten long time back, they must have in the school days or college days, they may have done these things. Uh, what is new? Einstein's relativity and so on, okay. So gravity, so where is, uh, why is general relativity also a theory of gravitation? In fact, it is a theory of gravitation which Einstein gave. But everybody learns, first of all, Newton's theory, okay, so which is here. You have two masses, okay, separated by distance r. Then the force between the two masses is given by, it's called the inverse square law. F is G M1, M2 or R squared into R cap. R cap is a unit vector joining these two. R is the distance. M1, M2 are the masses. So it's product of the masses divided by the square of the distance. So that's why it's called the inverse square law. And it's multiplied by this Newton's constant G, okay? And that is the culprit, okay? So that is what I'm going to talk about, okay? Why it took 100 years. And what does this do? This is a wonderful law, okay? So it gave this law. This law was given. And it explained two things simultaneously. It gave planetary orbits, okay. So planetary orbits were directly explained by this, but you had to develop some calculus. You use this force equation and use the second law of motion, integrate the equation of motion, and you get this particular orbit, say a planet going around the sun like this. It go, you get ellipses and all that. This is a textbook, uh, textbook, uh, you know, material. And you can apply this, apply this because the distance between, say, the Earth and the Sun is much larger than the size of the, each of the objects, like Sun and Earth. The Sun is about a million kilometers in size. Earth is about 10,000 kilometers, 12,000 kilometers in size. But the distance is 150 million kilometers. Huge distance, okay? So you can think of this as point masses and apply this law, okay? But here, terrestrial gravity, you think of a stone being thrown or apple, the legendary apple falling. Now the apple falling, is a more complicated thing because you don't have point masses. Earth is not a point mass. See, if you have an apple falling, maybe from 10 meters, it falls. Apple can be considered as a few centimeters in size, which, which can be considered as a point because 10 meters and few centimeters. Few centimeters can be thought of as a point as compared to 10 meters, but not the Earth. Earth is thousands of kilometers in size. So how can you think of, you can't apply this law straight away. So, a lot of things, Newton had to do a lot of things, he had to make his own mathematics. It was the development of calculus, okay. So, he had to develop calculus, he had to integrate. I mean, you have a, some stone or the apple falling on the earth, everything attracts it from this side, that side. So, you take small, small pieces of the earth, there's a Himalayas on one side, there is something on this side and so on. All are attracting that apple, okay. And uh, you have to sum up those elemental forces 
and finally get the resultant force. And what is that sum? That is simply an integral. You have to do an integral. An integral calculus was not there in Newton's time. Okay? No calculus was there. So he had, to, he had to wait something like 10, 20 years, in fact, to develop calculus and then say that this inverse square law is also correct, true for the Earth also, terrestrial gravity. So in a way, this was the first of the unifications of science. I mean, unification is one of the things in science. So terrestrial gravity was unified with gra gravity in space, okay? so planetary orbits and so on. So this was universal gravitation. So this was a huge success, actually. It's a resounding success. But then, why do we need another theory of gravity? It's a resounding success because it explained a lot of things. It explained things from, uh, you know, motions of macromolecules to things, the motions of galaxies and so on. But Newton's theory was inadequate for the following reason that Newton's gravity is inconsistent with the special theory of relativity, which was given by Einstein himself earlier. And special theory of relativity was right. Every time, everything was uh, according to special relativity. And this was inconsistent, Newton's gravity. And, we, and you simply cannot have inconsistent theories in the science, not just physics. In science itself, you cannot have inconsistent theories. So uh, one of the thing, examples is that in Newtonian gravity, signals travel instantaneously. Okay? That inverse square law which you saw there doesn't have any time in it. Okay? So if something shakes here or something moves here, immediately that uh, effect is transmitted throughout the universe. So if somewhere if I were to stand with some mass, I could shake the mass in such a way that I could send a signal at the end of the universe instantaneously, okay? which is impossible because of special theory of relativity, which tells you that all signals must travel at a finite speed. And the maximum speed is the speed of light, okay, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. The point is it's finite speed. So this theory was not right. So it had to be revamped. And he gave his general theory of relativity. That was the theory of relativity. So now, so what does this theory of relativity tell you? It tells you so many things that it's a different picture. The model is different now. You don't have a square, inverse square law or any force or something. And if you take the picture of the sun and the earth or a planet like that, the sun, for example, produces, curves the space-time around it. And the planet moves in the straightest possible path it can in that curved geometry. It's like, you know, I mean, if you have a surface for sphere, a sphere is a curved object, the simplest curved object. You can't draw a straight line on a sphere, okay? So if you have to go in a straight line, you'll always go on a curve if you go on a sphere. The same thing happens here. Here you cannot imagine, you can't visualize a four-dimensional curved space-time. But it is curved in this, you can mathematically, by equations, you can do that. And so what Einstein's theory tells you is that the whole space-time gets curved if there's any matter, matter or energy or many things like that. And if there's a planet, for example, the sun curves the space-time around it, and the planet, like the Earth, for example, moves in the straightest possible path it can in this curved geometry. It happens to be a curve because it can't move in a straight line. There's no straight line there. So Euclidean geometry is gone, okay? So this was a non-Euclidean geometry and so on. So only the law had to be given, like the inverse square law, and that, those are the Einstein's equations. And these are a very complicated set of equations, which are like uh, 10 equations and 10 unknowns, partial, differential, nonlinear equations. The Newton's equations were extremely easy as compared to that. Newton's equations are just linear equations, second order and so on. They're easy to solve. But these are difficult. and that's why it took such a long time. These were also some of the, you know, difficulties in actually detecting the black holes. Even theoretically, we could not get the waveform for 20 years. I mean, we had to do approximations and things like that, numerically integrate Einstein's equations and all that. So there are a lot of other prob problems also from the theoretical side. We need a template. So anyway, success of general relativity, it explains equally well falling apples and planetary orbits. I mean, same thing as what Newton's theory does. This also explains. There's no problem with that. But it predicts many more, many more things. It predicts uh, expanding universe, black holes, okay? That is also another thing. Uh, Newton's theory does not. And gravitational wave, that is the topic of today's lecture. So all these things were there. So what are gravitational waves then? 
As I said, gravitation is the manifestation of the curvature of space time. So, waves are what? There are waves in the ripples in the curvature of space time. So, the curves, curvature of space time that itself has ripples, ok. And that is what it is. I mean, you cannot visualize it, but you can measure its effect, ok. So, that is what we can do there. So, these are the properties of gravitational waves as general theory, general theory of relativity tells you. They travel with the speed c, universal speed c, which is the same as the speed of light 300,000 300, kilometers per second. This has been tested in the observations now. I will come at the end to that. Transverse, they are transverse and they have two polarizations just like electromagnetic waves. There also you have two polarizations, but only these are tensor waves. So, they are not vector waves like you have in electromagnetism. So, one way of understanding this wave is to see what is their effect on test particles, ok. So, as we know if you have a charge of for example, if you want to test whether there is an electromagnetic wave, what you do is you put the put a charge in the path of the wave. So, if you put a charge and you have a wave hitting this, the charge will oscillate, ok. And when the charge oscillates, you know you detect a electromagnetic wave. So, instead of putting one charge to amplify the effect, you put a whole antenna in which there are electrons and so on. So, all the electrons move up and down if there is electric field, then you get a current which you amplify and you detect as your uh, <coughs> as your electromagnetic wave. But here because this is a more complicated wave, it is a shear wave. So, you take a ring of particles. So, ring of test particles are taken like this and you think of a wave which goes into the blackboard or into this uh, screen. Then this circle becomes an ellipse like this then back to a circle, then it dips like this, where the semi major and semi minor axis are intercha interchanged. So, this is one of the polarizations, this is the cross polarization and a general wave is a linear combination of the two. So, now how do you detect this wave? You just instead of having a whole ring of particles, you just take three particles, ok. So, two particles at right angles here like this and one reference particle here, ok. And if you can monitor the distance between these particles, you would have detected the wave, ok. So, that is the way. So, this particle comes close, the, that particle moves away here. So, if you can monitor these distances and the best way to do this is with a laser, ok. So, you can use a laser interferometer and see the path difference by looking at the fringe shifts and things like that. So, anyway, so these are the, this is the way, this is the principle of detection. But in practice, this is very complicated, ok. So, this is the motion basically that happens with the gravitational wave, two polar, this is plus and this is cross, ok. Now, here these are extremely exaggerated this motions, ok, here which I have shown here. And the reason it took 100 years, why did it take 100 years? So, now the answer is here. <laughs> the answer is because of G. The gravitational constant G is extremely, the weak coupling is extremely weak, ok. Gravity is a weak force, it is the weakest force that we know, ok, in nature. And you have to measure things like 1 part in 10 to the 22 and here is a that is the simple experiment that you can perform ok to say that gravity is weak. So, this is the thing I can raise this glass of water ok here in this thing. So, the fact that I can raise this glass of water means that gravity is a very weak as compared to electromagnetic field. Why? Because the whole earth is pulling down on this glass ok the whole earth is pu pulling down, but with my arm I am able to raise it ok. And what is inside the arm? Basically, they are muscle contractions, muscles, muscle contractions and muscle contractions are what? Basically, chemical reactions and so on and that is all on electrodynamics. So, this is electromagnetic force versus gravitational force ok. 1 or 2 kilos versus I do not know how many 10 to the 24 kilos or something like that ok. So, that is the difference ok. So, there is a huge difference between the force. So, it is easier to 10 to the 24 or 10 to the 40 times easier to detect the electromagnetic wave than it is for a gravitational wave. So, that is why that is the problem because gravity is a very weak force. And so, you must measure something like 1 part in 10 to the 22. And so, in the present interferometers, okay, one has to measure things 1000 the size of a nucleus or a proton you can say. You have to go up to that level. I mean, you can say that 1 part in 10 to the 21, 10 to the 22. If I take a tabletop interferometer, which is say 1 meter in size, you would have to measure distances of 10 to the minus 21 meters. That is enormously, I mean, extremely small distance 
if I take something like that, ten to the minus twenty one meters, I mean that is a delta L if I say of this of this order is it is impossible thing. I mean ten to the minus fifteen meters is a Fermi, that is the size of a nucleus. This is a million times smaller than that, okay. So, how do you do that? So, that is the that is the whole trick. That is why it was a feat actually of actually measuring this kind of distances. So, anyway, there is a pioneer who was Weber who started this in 1960 s and or the mid 60s, mid 60s or 70s. He uh, uh, tried to do this with a Weber bar, it is called a resonant bar detector, aluminum cylinders and so on, and uh, he tried to do that. But uh, this is not a very uh, good design. In fact, a better design is laser interferometer, okay. So, which respects say the polarization pattern and so on. So, first of all, it is broadband, it is scalable, you can make it as big as you like, more or less. Then it is tuned to the quadrupole nature of the gravitational wave, as I said. And those masses are now mirrors, okay. The two masses that are are mirrors, the central, the reference mass is all the beam splitter basically. And if there is a gravitational wave which hits this, then there will be a path difference and that path difference will be detected by the detector. So, here is a probably a movie which tells you how this uh, thing works. So, anyway this tells you the it is a quadrupolar force field, the delta L is how much it moves, I mean that again comes from Einstein's theory is proportional to the length of the interferometer multiplied by this h which is basically the metric, it is called the metric and this h is of the order of 10 to the minus 21, ok. So, Einstein's equations with the curvature and all that, you go to do differential geometry and in differential geometry the metric is the most important thing as was as was you know proved by Gauss, you know Gauss theorems were there and he called it the theorema agrema, ok. Agrema is the best theorem that he proved was that all the differential geometry can be done if you give the metric, you need you do not need to do anything else. And agrema in fact is a word which is coming from actual Sanskrit, actually agram, agram is the best top ok. <laughs> so, <laughs> it is gone into Latin and somehow and things like that. <laughs> so, this is the interferometer ok <laughs> and this is the real interferometer which is there 4 kilometers in size. So, that ring which I showed you or the interferometer. So, what you do is you increase the length. So, delta L is h times L. So, if you instead of 1 meter use you use 10,000 meters or 4,000 meters. So, immediately you get a factor of 10 to the 4. Then you make the beam roll you know bounce many times. So, you make it bounce 100 times or something like that then you will get uh, even further this thing. So, if this is like 4 kilometers you will get 800 kilometers and so on. So, that is the kind of thing which is done here. So, you make the laser beam bounce many times and things like that inside this and finally, you can achieve uh, you know sensitivities of that order where h can reach of the order of 10 to the minus 22 or 10 to the minus 23. So, this uh, delta L is in fact uh, h times L, h is of the order of 10 to the minus 22 or something, h is the metric. I mean you write the eta mu nu plus h mu nu that is the usual equation which is written down for this thing anyway. So, this is the metric this is the flat metric and h mu nu is the Lorentz metric ok. Anyway that is not the point ok. So, I will show you the movie of this interferometer I do not know why it is not working. So, what happens is that it Basically, the interferometer has these two arms. So, I will act it out like this these are the two arms. So, one arm comes in, this arm goes up, this arm comes, that arm goes up. So, it is something like this. This is the motion actually in the thing. So, and then you measure the path difference between the things, ok. So, that is how you uh, detect a gravitational wave. <coughs> and you can see that there is a whole lot of it is a very, very complicated technology. So, all these things are there. So, you want to measure things at the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters, 10 to the minus 16 meters or something like that. So, you have to go to the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters ok. So, that is the kind of thing you want to go. That is an extremely small number. So, how do you do that? 
even this ground, if you see, is shaking at the level of 10 to the minus 6 meters, one micron level, okay. So you have to kill this sound and kill this all this noise. So you need seismic isolation. So there are seismic isolators which are here. This, this shows the seismic isolation, which is something like the isolation in your car, you know, I mean, so you don't, you, do, you are comfortable inside the car, even if, even if there are potholes. So when the car goes over the thing, the everything, the springs absorb all the oscillations while the seat remains in the same place. So exactly it's like that, it's based on that kind of thing. The spring is soft, so it, it has got resonance frequency of less than a hertz, but uh, you are measuring things at 10 hertz or 20 hertz or something like that. So high frequencies, you don't, the, the oscillation is completely damped at the level of one up to one to 100 or something like that. So you get this isolations. So every stage you can kill something like a factor of 100 in the noise, okay. So you put five, six stages of this and you can kill 10 to the 12 uh, amount of uh, noise. So if, it, even if this was at 10 to the minus 6 meters, you still get down to 10 to the minus 18 meters if you put six of these stages. Then there is the mirror which is there, mirror which is there for this thing. Everything has to be housed in vacuum, so you can't have laser light outside. So everything has to be in vacuum, the masses have to be in vacuum because you can't, you have to fight against the noise. So it will be seismic noise, even if the laser is in air, then what will happen is that the air will, uh, you know, disperse or what you call it, it will, uh, it will, uh, what, uh, yeah, it will scatter the laser light and that will produce noise in the thing. So you can't have that, so you must evacuate that, the whole thing is in a vacuum tube and you need uh, vacuum tanks in which all these masses and all that are hanging from the, what you call, uh, these seismic, uh, you know, isolators or this uh, seismic isolation. So all this kind of is a feat actually in technology and uh, this is what has been achieved with all these things. And with this you can get down to something like 10 to the minus 18 meters actually, something like thousandth of the size of a nucleus. So the now how far can the detector see? So these are the sort of the noise curves, these are theoretical noise curves actually. And uh, on this side is what is called the power spectral density of the noise and so on. But it comes down to, I will not talk too much about this, it comes down to 10 to the minus 21, 22, 23 right now with advanced LIGO detectors. The point I want to say here is that with, if you reach these sensitivities, how far can you see? So this is a picture, something like what you have on your Google map, okay. But the Google map here is that of the universe, okay. So this is your universe around the earth. Okay, so on around the earth you see this thing. What is this distance? You can hardly see this now. This is uh, like a hundred billion, uh, I don't know whether I have a bigger picture, but that will be much ahead I think. But anyway, this is like hundred billion light years. Up to here it is something like six hundred billion light years, okay. So when the LIGO, advanced LIGO, when it reaches its full sensitivity, it has not reached up to now, okay. It has re it reached in the first run, it reached only one third of the sensitivity. So it could see maybe up to here somewhere in this thing. For what source? The source was neutron star binary. So that is if you have neutron stars and neutron star binary going up, that will give a signal which can be seen somewhere up to here. But neutron stars are something of the order of 1.4 solar masses, okay. So it is just uh, 1.4 mass of the sun, okay, so that's, that's the size of the object. But the black holes which were seen were 30 solar masses. Because they were so large, the signal was much stronger. It was like 25 times or 30 times stronger than these. So although this was the size here, you could see right up to here, okay, the, because the mass, the black holes were very large. And these black holes were something like double this distance, something like 1.3 giga light years or 1.3 into 10 to the 9 light years, so billion light years, 440 megaparsecs, so that's something like that. So it could be see, you could see right up to here. So that's the sort of range. In the second run we got better, it went something like to 100, 90 or 100. And now I think it will come to something like half or somewhere here. I think the next run which will start uh, probably the next year in January, 
it should go to of this level, up to level, up to this. No? What's the difference? It's about uh, 120 megaparsecs. I mean, difference is, you mean percentage wise? The, the capacity. Yeah, so you can go for neutron star binaries, you will be able to go somewhere here. 120 megaparsecs. This is about 200, I think, <laughs> in this thing. But for black holes, you can see right up to there. So, much many more will uh, come into the picture. In fact, at full sensitivity, we expect uh, black hole coalescence every alternate day. <laughs> so, uh, it will be like 150 events a year or something like that. That is what we expect. Neutron star event up to now, we expected something like 1 or 2 per year. We got 1. That was the, that was the thing here. So, I think even that will go up. So, in fact, there was indirect evidence and I just want to just point out that uh, this was also a big thing that this uh, Hulse and Taylor binary pulsar, it is called Hulse Taylor binary pulsar. They observed gravitational waves and they got the Nobel Prize in 1993. So, this is the second Nobel Prize in a way for gravitational waves. <laughs> and uh, this was for saying that these pulsars which are there, they observed the pulsar for from 75 to 2005, oh, things are going on still. But I have the plot up to there. And what it shows is the, uh, uh, how much the stars are falling closer together. So, the pulsars are something like very far apart. The period is something like 8 hours or something. But as they, but it is so far away, the gravitational waves are coming out quite slowly. So, they fall towards each other and the period decreases at the rate of something like 70 microseconds per year. And uh, this was what have what has been plotted here is that the, since it is decreasing, the stars come closer, they come to the same position faster than it would if there were no gravitational waves. So, that is the sort of thing. So, your cumulative effect if you see, these are the plots, these are the points which are seen at ob observations. And this is the curve which you see here is the curve predicted by general theory of relativity. Okay. Relativity so, this is another feather in Einstein's cap. Okay. So, <laughs> you can see, so this was in fact the first indirect detection we call it because we did not really see gravitational waves on earth as it were, but we could at least uh, infer that there were gravitational waves coming from the thing. So, this is the basic object. So, I mean some, uh, if you think about this, coalescing compact binaries, this is the waveform which looks like this. So, the two stars go around each other, as they go around each other, they coalesce. Okay. And for ground based detectors, the frequency range is from something like 10 hertz to kilohertz or something like that. So, you need to, uh, <coughs> so the stars have to be compact, that is what it means. Because otherwise, you will not get uh, anything going up to 10 hertz. If they are white dwarfs or any other thing, you will only have things uh, of the order of, uh, I do not know, 1 tenth or 1 hundredth of a hertz or something like that. But if you want something like 10 hertz, then you need compact stars like neutron stars or black holes. And this is the kind of waveform you see in this thing. And uh, so, this is a prediction there, but it is very hard to get this waveform. So, at some point I will say this thing that this is the compact coalescing compact binaries, the waveform, the in spiral as it is called in the beginning, that was that you cannot solve Einstein's equation. The equation, the equation is so complicated, nobody has been able to solve them analytically so far. Okay for a two body problem. You know in uh, Newtonian mechanics you can do this. I mean you get it, it is a well known problem in this textbook. Goldstein for example, has that in the third chapter. Okay. So, it is there. <laughs> so, how it goes uh, reduced mass and all that sort of thing and then you can uh, actually solve get the solution. But here analytic exact solution is not opted so far. Nobody has opted up to now. I, I do not know whether it will be obtained. So, either you have to do approximations or you have to do something, some kind of a, or you have to do numerically, you have to actually integrate the equation. But even numerically, it is very difficult because these equations are hard. It is nothing like, you know, one equation. There are 10 equations to be solved for 10 unknowns, partial, nonlinear, worst thing that you can ever get, okay. So, I do not know from where <laughs> this kind of things came, okay. So, <laughs> So, this numerical relativity also took many, lo very long time to actually do this. 
So the one of the things was that there was a B R Iyer, Bala Iyer, and his group also in Bangalore, who, uh, in collaboration with the French group, they were also working out these things from for the from 1990, and finally they got the, the last term. You took you take you need something like six terms or something. They have calculated the six term just calculation with Mathematica and all that took three years to calculate. So you can see how complicated those mathematics those calculations were actually. And numerical relativity also did things later, and there also for ring down, what is the last part of the waveform which is there? So I don't know whether I have this thing here. Okay, so ring down. This is the ring down when the thing, whole thing merges, and finally the black hole settles into a stationary state, and there are no no more waves. But when it oscillates in the ring, it's a decay of the whole thing. It's it rings like a bell, you can say. So this was actually predicted by Rishi Shishara in 1970. Okay, so this was the thing, and uh, so he was the first to point out that this kind of thing is there. Of course, after that, a lot of people did work on it and things like that. And most prominent among them is Chandrasekhar. His whole book has got two, three chapters on it. Okay, on this thing, it's completely uh, wiped out the subject. I mean, like any other thing, whatever he took. Uh, uh, I mean, he took as a project. It was completely and fully done. I mean, completely. So, as <laughs> in his own, in his style. So, so this is the thing. It's called the perturbation theory. Okay. So, you perturb the thing and solve for the perturbation equation. So, the uh, post-Newtonian first, then the merger, which has to be numerical, and then the ring down. Then you have to stitch the waveforms together, and you have the full waveform. And that forms your template. And then you have to extract the signal from the noise. And that's where we come in. So that was our uh, contribution as to how to extract the signal from the noise. So there were these papers in 1991 and 94 actually, which uh, showed how to do this. So here's your signal. Then uh, much, I mean, you put this in the noise, and much, uh, I mean, you reduce the amplitude and put it in the noise. And then if you do this batch filtering operation, you can extract this. If the peak comes out, you know where the signal is, when the signal arrives at the detector, you get a peak here. It arrives means what? It comes into the bandwidth of the detector. The signal, the gravitational waves are all, all, all the time coming. But you have the detector bandwidth from say 10 hertz onwards. At 10 hertz, the signal has entered the detector. So what is the time? So that is this time. So that is the time of arrival. So, but the point is that it is not just one signal. You do not know what are the masses. You do not know what are the phases. You do not know what is the orbital inclination of the, the orbit and so on. So there are so many other parameters. So you have to search your parameter space through masses, times of arrival, phases, and all that. And this has to be done with the available computational resources you have, computer resources. So how to do that efficiently and quickly? We used a whole lot of group theory, actually groups, which are known. I mean, in mathematics, they are known as groups. You know, I mean, you add two elements, you get the same element. I mean, of the same set, and so on. So group theory is very important here because group theory gives you symmetries. So symmetries can be exploited so that you can do this thing in short time. I mean, in enough time so that uh, your computers are not exhausted. Okay, so the computers have you can have enough computational power. So in time of arrival, phases and all that, you can do the use this group theory. You can use the fast Fourier transform. You can use linear combination of vectors and so on, so vector spaces. So we use all that to give this, anyway. So that was our contribution. So that was, so this was basically the thing which allowed, uh, how much is I think, have I exceeded something, okay. Maybe, huh, 10 minutes or something. So I am near the, about 10 minutes from the talk, end of the talk. So this was the signal which was seen here, okay. And uh, so this was the first event. And you can see in this case, not much of match filtering was required. What our thing was that it was actually, it stood above the noise, okay, this signal. So you can see this. So the two detectors, you can see it's almost the same, LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston. And it has been shifted by the time delay. The time delay was 7 milliseconds. So it has been shifted by that and brought to the same level and one put on top of the other, okay, so superposed on the top. So you can see that it, it can see here. And this was like 36 solar masses, 29 solar masses. 
So these two black holes of 36 solar mass and 29 solar masses, they went around each other and they formed a single black hole of mass 62. Okay. So now here again Einstein's equation comes in because this is 36, this is 29. So the sum is 65, but the final black hole mass is 62. So what happened to the three, three solar masses? They all were converted into gravitational waves. Okay. So the mass to energy. So E equal to mc square. So you apply that equation. <laughs> so it was a very, very strong wave which came in. Although they were 1.3 giga light years, that means billion light years away, still the energy was like few ergs per centimeter square per second. That was the flux <laughs> at earth, on the earth. Okay. Then the event two was this, uh, this was black holes of this mass. And uh, so that was another one, but this is inside the noise, you can't see anything. So here our method had to be used, <laughs> that means how to batch filter, how to pull out the things. Of course, our method means that was like 91, 94. That method had to be, you know, 25 years have gone since then. So it had to be, it was improved on much more, I mean, many more things were done. We had used only 10,000 filters or 1,000 or 10,000, now it's a million. 250,000 filters with two masses, spins, and so on. So, so this is one of the other events. This is the neutron star binary. So, this was one of the events which all the astrophysicists got very excited about. So the, the two neutron stars which collided with each other and uh, so this was something, it was, a, it, this was a one, I mean all others were black holes but this was a neutron star event. Two neutron stars as I said they are made of neutrons only, these stars. They are extremely compact like 10 kilometers radius but uh, their uh, mass is that of the sun, okay. I mean the sun is million kilometers almost in radius. So these are extremely compact like 10 to the 14 grams per cc. So one spoon will weigh something like a ton, okay. That batter will weigh something like that. So these are extremely complicated things, I mean very uh, dense objects. And what happened was that, that you got also a jet from that, okay, which was observed. And uh, there's a gamma ray burst, which was the gamma rays were observed from this. So the gamma rays were observed something like 1.7 seconds after the gravitational wave merger. So gravitational waves came first and 1.7 seconds later there was a gamma ray burst. And then uh, there was afterglow and so on, 10 hours later one could see this optically. So in all other electromagnetic spectrum, the same event gave rise to electromagnetic radiation. Okay. So this was a very interesting event from the point of view of astronomy and astrophysics. And uh, in fact, here itself there was a lecture on this, that kind of thing, only on the last part, the radio observations, the radio astronomers came and they are still observing, it is still in progress. One year has gone after that event, so that was in August uh, 17th or something like that, last year. Now it is more than a year, but the radio, radio waves are still coming from that event actually. So all these things could be explained. Uh, by the radio astronomers after the event. And uh, so, so many findings were there that astrophysical implications. One thing was that there was association with the galaxy because of the optical component. The optical part could be seen from a certain galaxy. It is called NGC 4993. And it was 40 megaparsecs away. 40 megaparsecs means 130 million light years. Okay. It was something like 130 million light years. And you get this very accurately from gravitational waves. Okay, I mean, usually in astronomy, it's very hard to get distances. We have something called the cosmic ladder. Okay, you have to keep on going like that. With gravitational waves, you get it directly. Okay, the distance you can solve for for any binary because of the masses and all that. The how the phasing goes, depending on the phasing, you know the masses 
from the masses, you know the amplitude, the absolute amplitude. And from the apparent and the absolute amplitude, you can solve for the distance. So the distance is absolutely extremely well determined. So you got something like 40 megaparsecs, what is called 130 million light years. And there's only one galaxy there, which was called the NGC, which was emitting in uh, optical. And uh, why this is, it's the p value is something like 10 to 1 minus p is 10 to the minus 5, 8, meaning that that's how sure we are that that's the galaxy. And the speed of gravitational waves, now general relativity of course predicts the waves to be traveling at the speed of light. But one could see that from this, the electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves reached almost at the same time. So there was like 1.7 or 2 seconds. If they traveled at a different velocity because they are 130 million light years, it would have taken a lot of time. I mean, even if they were slightly 1% off, you would, have, you would have not seen the gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves at the same time. So that puts a bound in one part in 10 to the 15. It is few seconds divided by 130 million years. That's the bound. Then the, what is called the Hubble constant, the Hubble constant also for cosmology, that could be also measured from this because you know the distance, you can measure the redshift and hence get the Hubble constant which is something like 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This is a prediction from the gravitational waves. So there are so many other things. Here also equation of state constraints. You can see how compact the stars were and so on. So a lot of astrophysical information also was seen from this uh, uh, sources. There are also other things from the earlier things that what generally the photon is supposed to be massless. But suppose there is a theory which says that it has a mass. These things put uh, constraints on that. The constraint is like so much, 10 to the minus 23 over EV over C square. That comes from, if the, the thing has the mass, the whole waveform will get squashed. Okay? And that we don't see. And things like that. So, things are there. Okay, I will not so much go into this. So, now I think I will come to the end of the talk. So, that is the thing here. So, we have so many detectors around two detectors in the US, these are the, these are the ones which observed and the last two events, the Virgo detector came into the picture. And now there is the Kagura, this is the Japanese detector that is also, that is not yet online, but should come next year sometime online, okay. So these are all these detectors and of course LIGO India, okay. So this is the thing which we want to build now in the next uh, few years or so. So LIGO India, so one of the things is that if LIGO India comes, that particular event which I showed, okay, it could be uh, located, you know, the more the detectors there are, the better you can locate where the source is and so on. So the, for example, the source detection is very accurately determined if you have a long baseline, okay. So LIGO India gives an extremely large baseline, so that's one of the most important strategic reasons why there should be LIGO India. So why LIGO India? So strategic geographical location of for GW astronomy or gravitational wave astronomy. Because you are so far away from all other detectors, we get long baseline, okay, that is the thing. And so this event which was uh, located to something like 30 square degrees by LIGO and the Virgo, if LIGO India was there, it would have been few square degrees. So you would have immediately you know, locked on to the event very quickly. So that is the mo most important thing of LIGO India, geographical location and uh, so many things, the improved location of sources required for multi messenger astronomy. So the more detectors here, the better. And we already have a large data analysis trained manpower because we already trained them from Ayuka for the last 30 years. So <laughs> this power is already there, manpower for actually extracting the signal from the noise. They are already there doing things on that, I mean from all this and potentially a large science community. So now <laughs> opening, so actually this is opening a new window to the universe, the gravitational waves. The first window was opened by Galileo, okay, with the telescope, optical telescope 400 years ago. So when he pointed the telescope at the Jupiter and saw the moons. And then the second window was radio astronomy. So, which was like something like 1930, 1940, 50. And each time you open a new window, you see new things, okay. 
So radio astronomy saw things which uh, optically you could have never seen. Things like pulsars, the what is called the cosmic microwave background, and uh, radio jets and things like that. Okay, and all these things were seen in radio, but not in uh, optically. Optically, this could never be seen. This was 1930. And now we have got so many other windows, optical, radio, infrared, all these things. The infrared has told us that there are other solar systems, just like ours in our own uh, galaxy. So there are planets and so on. So these are probes, all probes of the universe. And now we have got gravitational wave astronomy. So looking ahead, we have more detectors, better sensitivity. And now there are plans to put detectors in space. There is the laser interferometric space antenna, which will be probably 15 years from now. China is putting, trying to put a detector in space and so on. So here, so this is just the beginning, okay, this is not the end, the beginning of astronomy, gravitational wave astronomy. So thank you, so that's the thing. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for uh, briefing us on a topic which we don't understand at all. So <laughs> pardon my question, it is a layman's question, but I have two questions really. Yeah. One is that you showed a simplistic model hmm. of uh, how gravity is, um, you know, actually the space-time thing is yeah, curved because yeah. of uh, high yeah. mass and low mass. So that's a but cartoon it, basically. Yeah, yeah. Huh. And then just like the earth, there are so many other objects not hmm. in the same plane, they are going yeah. in different planes. Huh. So net effect will be a vector addition of all of them to find yeah, out what the not, gravitational wave will be. Yeah, so, so how is that corrected? That is yeah, it's, a extremely, it's impossible problem almost in general relativity. Okay. You do, do it numerically also it will be difficult. So in that case there will be some kind of inaccuracy in whatever we uh, yeah, yeah. predict. But the, the one thing is that the advantage is that it's a very weak field. Okay. So you can make approximations. Okay. So you can make first order approximations then it comes down to Newton's theory. So Newton's theory is the weak field limit okay. of Einstein's theory. So if you go to weak fields and low velocities, which is low velocity means that the velocities of the objects like Earth or whatever, they travel, they are traveling at much le less speed than the speed of light. Okay. If the speed of the object is much lesser than the speed of light, then uh, it's low velocity or we say slow motion. And uh, weak field means like that yeah. uh, HVU nu is uh, extremely small, uh, much, much smaller than one. Here it is 10 to the minus 23 for uh, planets and all that, something like that. I mean, the sun's field at the earth is at the level of 10 to the minus 8. Mm. So, it is uh, 2 gm or gm over c square. So, that's so why you can <laughs> ignore these. Yeah, okay. ignore it basically. The other question is uh, more related to what you mentioned. Huh. that you've been working in the field of the Indian Lego for a long time yeah. and now our in principle decision has been taken. Yeah. The question I want to ask is, see, finally there are already three such uh, systems in place. Of course, as you said, the Indian one will give higher accuracy. Yeah. But why are we not going to the next area like the space-based systems, yeah. which I am told the uh, Europeans are getting in, yeah. because that does away with a lot of inaccuracies which occurred. Yeah. Which have to be isolated in the, on the earth. Yeah, we should. So, instead but of investing now in the fourth system, hmm. uh, why not we participate in something which is uh, of the next Yeah, order so already energy. there is, uh, I mean, that also go, I mean, should be done, as you are saying. But there are different sources also. I mean, these sources for this and the sources for the space detectors are different. So, the, sp the space detectors are basically much longer in length size. Yeah, no, no then uh, you get low frequency sources. But you will not be able to measure high frequency, uh, like the black hole things and so on, black hole mergers or uh, what do you call, things which tear apart, uh, things like that. But uh, the space detectors can do things at very low frequencies. So that is also very important. So it's like radio astronomy and optical astronomy. So they are complementary to each other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess my first question was partially uh, asked. Uh, I was going to ask yeah. you about the space-based. Uh, is the Europe uh, first question is the European-based system actually yeah. working already, or is it still under process? And the second question is a little unrelated, but 
uh, we talked about the merging black holes and the uh, the pulsars. The, yeah. Are there yeah. any other events that we are looking for? So, for example, you right, know, right. Super, yes, yes. supernova or yeah. any large which can also emit a similar gravitational wave signature yes, or yes, yes, something yes. that can be detected? No, there are many other sources also, which I didn't mention because lack of time. The thing is, uh, and the other thing is that we have only seen this type of source. All seven events have been uh, binaries like that. That's why I have only talked about that. But there are things like the stochastic background. There is a continuous, the pulsars themselves, if they rotate, they can emit also gravitational waves. And uh, one should be able to detect that also. But we have not yet detected that. Then the stochastic background is also there. That is the unresolved background, just like the cosmic microwave background is there. A similar background we expect will exist here also. And uh, so that's another source. Then what a supernova type, a burst type of sources. That's another source. Yeah, so they are there. I mean, I just didn't talk about them. And what are the first question? No, space based is not, none of them, nothing is yet okay, there. Okay, yeah, yeah, still uh, LIGO, it's called not LIGO, laser interferometric space antenna. Laser interferometric space antenna. But there are, uh, there have been what they call, what is that thing called? The pilot projects like that. So uh, it was called something or the other, I forgot the name for it. But uh, and that was set up in 2015. And it showed such, uh, I mean, remarkable things. It showed uh, sensitivity two orders of magnitude better than what was thought. <laughs> so immediately things got funded actually. Uh, 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 you that the gravitational waves arrived 1.7 seconds before the… After. After, huh? I, I misunderstood. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's after the gravitational wave event. First, yeah, they arrived first. No, no, no. It just happened afterwards. That that event, it's a, what is called a jet, and uh, one of the so there is a lot of uh, about hundred papers have come out after that. <laughs> okay, on this particular thing, and uh, the current explanation is that uh, there is a that whole jet is there. Okay, relativistic jet inside which is produced by the neutron stars and uh, that forms a cocoon of that uh, neutron star material and but the whole thing is opaque and so you can't see it but when the cocoon breaks through that opaque material you see the gamma rays and but it took 1.7 seconds to for the cocoon to break through the opaque material so that's the basic thing so earlier people used to think it was basically the relativistic jet but its energy is like five orders of magnitude less. So it was much different from the other gamma ray bursts or something like that. So yeah. one question I had was connected to the previous one. So yeah. the space antenna, yeah. uh, like we said that, uh, you know, the frequencies that it detects uh, yeah. are of a different regime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what if we uh, create a four kilometer arm length in space? or something comparable. Yeah, so you don't need to go to 4 kilometers, you can make much, much bigger. Huh. Yeah, so, we can, but yeah. then that way we end up detecting uh, supermassive black hole mergers, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can but, make something smaller, but 4 kilometers you won't make. I mean, you will make something normally much bigger. Whatever, yeah. but uh, something uh, that, uh, you know, uh, lets you coordinate with earth-based... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, th there is a, again a Japanese project called Desigo, okay. which is making something like uh, 10,000 kilometer size or 1,000 kilometer size detector, okay. Okay. which will go between the other detectors, which are 5 million kilometers. Uh -huh. The li laser interferometric antenna has a arm length. Yeah. It's a triangle. Right. And uh, the triangle is, uh, all of these are triangles basically. Right. And the uh, thing is that it's a triangle yeah. and the length of the side of the triangle is like 5 million kilometers. Yeah. 17 seconds of laser light right. travel time actually. Yeah. So again to connect with the other yeah. speaker uh, yeah. on the same question. So this Desigo will connect two of them. So yeah. the bandwidth of that detector is from 10 to the minus 4 hertz yeah. to about 10 to the minus 1 hertz or 10 to the minus 2 
LISA, that is Laser Intrusive Space Antenna. And this DECIGO is from 10 to the minus 1 hertz to something, about 1 hertz or something like that. Actually, okay. that will reduce, that can enable detection of a much weaker signal. <laughs> So yeah, so all sorts of detectors are being planned actually. Right. There is one something called the Einstein telescope which Europe is planning. Yeah. So that is going to be underground, right. but uh, much longer. I don't know how much, 10 kilometers or larger than that, yes. maybe 150, I, I don't know exactly the length. Right. But it will go something like from 1 hertz onwards. Mm -hmm. See the problem here is that for increasing the length of the earth yes. is one is technical because the mirrors are there. Uh, if they are too far away, the mirrors hang like this, ah. because they point towards the earth, ah. center of the earth. Right. So then all these technical problems come in of, you know, <laughs> things like that, or you know, of the bouncing and things, yeah. uh, things like that. So the curvature of the earth prevents that, basically. So you have to get around that. Maybe there are ways to do that now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> no. Yeah, uh, yeah. So Giga light years away. Away. Okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, billion, billion years back. Billion years back. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. Event we are watching today. Yeah, yeah. But then, what is the impact of the expanding universe, Doppler shift, and the rest of the universe between? Don't they also affect? They also the affect. Yeah. So even here, uh, as I showed, one of the, the 40 megaparsecs away, the neutron star, there is a redshift. It has a redshift. The universe is expanding. And if you see that uh, thing, it was said was something like uh, uh, one percent or something like that, point not not nine or How something. Do you for all? Huh? How do you compensate? No, you don't need to compensate. You just measure. No. Oh. So, for example, this one I can show you that one slide was there, not for the one point three giga light years, but that will be even more shifted. I didn't mention that. Yeah. So this. Z, Z is the redshift and that is, this is the cosmology, so that's what it has impact on the cosmology. You can measure what is called the Hubble constant. So V is H naught times DL. So H naught is the th parameter which you want to measure for the cosmology. And we can measure Z directly of the galaxy, okay, which is uh, 40 mega and this distance comes from gravitational waves observation. So this 40 mega bar six is very accurate, okay extremely accurately measured by uh, gravitational waves. And this comes from uh, actual observations, optical or whatever. And so using these two things, you can calculate H naught. So Z is V also, you can calculate at what rate it is going away. So it's like 3000 kilometers per second or something, roughly. And therefore you get H naught, which is 70 kilometers per second. So all this, uh, you don't cancel, you just measure parameters of cosmology. So one is the uh, what do you call the Hubble constant as it's called of the universe. <laughs> okay, so I think we will uh, we'll stop the question answer session here because otherwise it will be a continuous thing. Uh, let me just thank the speaker uh, for a wonderful journey that he made us go through. Right from the Newton's laws of motion to the Einstein's theory to the practical way in which it was actually envisaged and confirmed to the to the to the scenario that we are in today so it was it is really a difficult task sir and you did it really well <laughs> thank lecture. you uh, let me thank uh, Aisar pune also for the entire logistics uh, i would now request the chairperson of uh, the committee uh, professor amitav malik to as a token of appreciation uh, give a give a memento to the speaker, Professor Durandar. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. Finally, let me thank all the audience here for attending this particular talk. Thank you all. Okay.